for more on art and resistance, I spoke recently with poet, lyricist, MC, screenwriter and organizer Boots Riley, founder and frontman of the Oakland-based hip-hop group The Coup. He's also the author of a brand new book, Tell Homeland Security We Are the Bomb. Watch now to see part one of our conversation. Watch again next week to see part two. Organizing was tied in early to your life. Your family were organizers. I've heard that phrase a lot, but I haven't heard you really talk about what they did or who they were. Introduce okay. them to us, if you would. Um, so my father was uh, in the, he joined the NAACP when he was 12 years old in the 50s um, and actually left the church because the church wouldn't support the civil rights movement. What church or, was he in? Uh, some sort. My my grandmother actually was a uh, Pentecostal preacher, so I don't know the name of the church. But he was kicked out of that church because he st he stood up and said that it, in in church and said that the church needs to join the civil rights movement. And the pastor said, the pastor said, well, that's blasphemy because those are worldly things. You know, a lot of black churches weren't in the civil rights movement, which was why there was a need for the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference. But anyway, so they said, this is, that's blasphemy. And then my, so my father said in church, uh, well, if Jesus doesn't want to be part of my freedom, I don't want any part of Jesus. And uh, so he was kicked out. Um, hasn't gone back. Uh, he was then in, he was in the NAACP in CORE uh, in Durham and uh, was part of the organizing efforts that led to some of the first uh, sit-ins in uh, other parts of North Carolina. And then he, CORE moved him to San Francisco and he, and, and he got involved in more radical politics and he joined uh, SDS and Progressive Labor Party um, he was involved in the San Francisco State Strike where he met my mother, who was a student. Talk a bit about your take on, while well, we're talking about social movements, your take on the Black Panthers and their successes and maybe things they could have done differently. Because they tried to address some of the things you're talking about, both the social, the basic needs, the defiance, having some might yeah. to actually go up against the state. So I definitely had a period in my life where I was very obsessed with the Panthers. Um, I read numerous books that I could get my hand on. I think like the best book is David Hilliard's book, uh, This Side of Glory, um, and ended up working with a lot of them. We had an organization called uh, the Mau Mau Rhythm Collective early on that a lot of ex-Panthers would bring their kids and make them join us, and, you know. Um, but I think that um, there's a lot of focus put on that, that organization without looking at, not just critiquing what they were doing, but critiquing what they were doing um, with regard to the actual effect it had at the time. So for instance, um, you know, even in the late 60s, the Panthers would hold a rally and it was mainly white people, right? And which is, obviously everyone needs to be organized, but for an organization that was saying that their mission was to organize the black community, it says something about what, ab about the effect that they were having. And some of that had to do with, some, some of that had to do with stuff that they identified, which was the spectacle. For instance, the Panthers um, stopped, in, stopped wearing the berets and the leather jackets in 1968. They existed for a while after that, but we only see the pictures of them with the berets and the jackets. The reason that they stopped wearing the berets and the jackets is they realized that the spectacle was making people on, feel like they weren't revolutionary, like, wow, that is, some, that is something to look up to and we support you, go ahead, keep doing it. And, and, but, but for, so our view even of what the Panthers were is really not, it, it, you know, we're looking at those, those pictures and we're not really seeing what, what it was. In the late 60s, there were still factories in Oakland. There was still a way to organize around that. And people, 
I mean, people of color are human beings. We're trying to survive, right? And, and so while there was stuff around free breakfast programs and things like that, it still had the same problem as we all have, showing people the way of what, what's our power base. And, and so I think we don't look at that like, and so for a lot of time, you know, when I went to college and for a long time after, it was kind of like, we need to bring this back to the days of, to the, to the 1960s. But no, we don't need to bring it back to the 1960s. We need to bring it back to the 20s and 30s as far as the strategy. We've done a lot of coverage on this program of uh, new economic efforts, efforts to bring sort of economic might into the hands of communities that don't have it. Talk about how you see those two things connecting in your worldview, the kind of extreme policing, extreme racism, and extreme inequality. How do they relate? And are there any groups that are connecting it in a useful way? Racism has a, a, a utility in capitalism. That's why it exists. One of those, those utilities is to say, Okay, so first of all, the reason there's a need for it is that capitalism must have unemployment, right? In order to keep wages low, there needs to be an army of unemployed people so that your boss can say, look, you can get fired, and blah, 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 keep these wages. Matter of fact, Wall Street Journal and all these folks, they get, they get worried when the unemployment rate goes too low because that means wages are going up. So you have to have unemployed people. Uh, under capitalism. And unemployed people also have to eat. So um, we end up having this illegal economy, right? Because that's where, that's the jobs that can be created. Follow me, this is, so that, so illegal business, just like legal business, both of them use violence to regulate themselves. Legal business, if you, if you got a supermarket and you got a cart full of groceries, you you, you take it out without paying, somebody's gonna physically stop you. And that's gonna either be the store security or it's gonna be police. So legal business has the police. Um, illegal business doesn't have the police, they have themselves. So for instance, right now, you rob a liquor store, you rob the liquor guy, the police come after you. In the 1920s, you rob the liquor guy, the gangsters come after you. It's regulation of business, and that's what causes, uh, well, it's quote unquote crime, and that's, that's what causes the violence associated with crime. But there's this, this picture that's put out there, and what they tell us is that it's not poverty. And they tell us that poverty also is created by the bad choices of the impoverished. And how do they tell us that? They show us the, uh, they, sh they show the, they show the other and say, hey, these are the folks that are savage, that they're culturally wrong, father's not in the household, those sorts of things lead to this. And, you know, uh, and, and so here is why poverty happens. And that's why racism is important because that makes the white working class identify with the system, right? And so there's a utilitarian aspect to that. And, and that also is what okays the police being in communities of color and, uh, and beating the hell out of people and murdering them because that is, those are the culprits. That's what's, what's put out there. So the inequality and racism and abuse that comes from, from racism and the oppression that comes from racism, it, it happens more to one group so that they don't have to do it to everyone. For information on Boots Riley's tour and his book, Tell Homeland Security We're the Bomb, visit our website. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe and thanks.